Hey friends, welcome to the Ask a Shane B podcast. We are jumping into all of your questions about worship leading. I'm Jeremy Jaqua here with Shane Bernard from Shane and Shane. What's up, man? Hey, man. How you doing? I'm great. Awesome. Uh, we're having a good day here. Jumping into a fun one today about drum volume and overall volume. One of my favorite topics. <laughs> People telling me to be quieter. It's the best. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Ask Jeremy J. <laughs> Where uh, we we answer all of your questions on <laughs> worship volume drumming. Perfect. Please just stop hitting so loud. If you could just not hit, it's I'm hitting it with sticks. <laughs> don't use. Like, sticks. I can't. Oh, okay. Oh, just don't use sticks. Yeah. Oh, just don't do what I've done for twenty years. So uh, <laughs> why don't you get into the question? Yeah. We'll... <laughs> so here's <laughs> here's the question. Uh, it says, "Dear Shane, we are a smaller. We are in a smaller building than Watermark, and we don't have a drum enclosure to be able to balance all the instruments and singers well. I have to keep our sound at around eighty-five dB. Ninety dB is the high at the highest is my aim. Occasionally, people will say that it's loud and ask if I could turn it down. I could turn it down." but then the drums would get so loud that they overpower the instruments and the singers. We put some deadening devices on the cymbals and the snare to try to take down some of the sound, but everything's still pretty loud. Do you have any suggestions? Oh, do I? From Will. Oh, do I? Um, it's, we've just decided... Do, do tell, Shane. Can't wait. <laughs> we have decided to uh, riff... Freely, I'm just gonna riff on this a little bit. On this, um, and so this maybe not the most structured podcast you're gonna hear, uh, but just maybe a handful of thoughts and ideas. Um, and thank you so much for your question. Uh, this is, I mean, this is a this is a question everywhere, from the largest of churches to the smallest of churches, and and uh, obviously just want to point out this question is so different um, in every single room. Sure. So the answer to this question is different in every single room. Yeah, to be clear, I've been asked to play quieter in a room as big as Watermark's room. Oh, totally. Yeah, it's not like, oh, we're in a huge room, so it doesn't matter. It's totally. always a factor. It's always it's yeah. always an issue. So just a couple things, um, just to point out from your email. Uh, one, one obvious uh, thing that you said... Um, about the decibel level uh, that's worth mentioning. It's maybe like another podcast, um, but it does apply uh, that 85 decibels shouldn't be painful at all. Uh, it can be painful. 85, 90 can be painful. Um, but Adam Westlake here just had a great analogy. Um in that uh, most of the time, I think when 85 decibels, it doesn't feel good on your ears. It's um, it's not because it's too loud. Like you're looking at a decibel meter and it says, man, it's peaking at 85, it's peaking at 88. And, but my, but it hurts. And, and it's like, well, wh- wh- how could that be? And his analogy was, if you take a pen and you have somebody lean against that pen and put like, 10, 20 pounds of pressure, 30 pounds of pressure on it. That's going to sting a little bit. But if you lean against this, something flat, then it's probably going to feel kind of nice. And the harder you lean against it, eventually it'll start hurting. Like if you put a ton of pressure on it. But um, And that's what I'm talking about of uh, if you look globally at your at your PA, and sometimes this just really helps to bring somebody in you know, to do that, um, to start from scratch of like what kind of global EQ, what kind of things are going on to the whole thing. And then look at individually at channels. Cause sometimes there's just frequencies that are like a, like a pencil and they're just, eh. and so that's, what's hurting is there's something out there. Um, and that could be happening out of the speakers. If you're in a small room, like you said, I mean, your drum kit gets up to a certain decibel level that you have to lift everything above it. Well, just things acoustically in that drum kit might just be painful. I mean, when I go play the drums over here in the studio, I mean, it hurts. It hurts, even if I'm not. And so I'll, I'll, I'll like dampen, put things on my ears. I have these little things we put on. And it's like, oh, okay. And, th- and that's a similar thing of like, man, just taking out some of those frequencies that are just, that are, that are poking out, that are painful. 
Um, so that could be something that you could do. Uh, I've heard mixes in our room. Uh, Travis Brockway is a engineer that is just phenomenal. He does some classes on the worship initiative with us. And I've heard um, mixes over a hundred decibels that feel so great on my ears. They just, I mean, it's almost like I could take a nap. And so sometimes it's not, and then I've heard, I've heard mixes under 90 that are painful. And so uh, you just have to know that it could be something in there frequency wise that's poking out. That's, um, that's causing the, the uncomfortableness or it's sure. causing somebody to come out of their chair afterwards and go, it's too loud. Well, it may <laughs> not be because the meter's too loud. It may be because there's something poking out that's, that's not feeling good. Sure. And um, so just know that um, th- that would be a fun podcast in general to just talk about that and to show even um, from a console some things that you can do to, to help with that. Um, some other things. This is another like high level deal that uh, it's taken a while to really learn this thought. Um, the goal of drums so if you're miking drums, I assume we're talking to folks that are that are miking their drums. Um, if you have a really small room, maybe you're not, but maybe you should if you have a PA. Uh, because my, my goal these days, uh, whether it's in, whether it's in, honestly, whether it's in the studio or whether it's in some auditorium at a church um, or a room in a church, is I'm trying to get the audio from the strike of a drum to hit somebody's ears via the PA, not via the drum. Does that make sense? And so like if you're sitting on the second, third row and somebody hits that snare drum, are you hearing it off the stage, like from the drum, or are you hearing it from speakers on the PA? And so th- that would be the goal, which is why a lot of people go to the whatever, what, what do you call the rolling unit or whatever the little little pads. Oh, the that, SPD, SPD little, SX. What's that thing called in general? Uh, electric drum it's like kit. A drum pad? Oh, you mean like an electric drum set, electric like drum a full-on drum set. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So then you're not hearing, well, actually, I was at a church and you heard the strikes. It was so bad. It was like, <laughs> um, but you, you know, you're hearing the drum, not from the strike, from the stick of the little pad, you're hearing the drum coming out of the speaker. And that's a similar concept. And um, it's taken a long time to go, man, if you just if you just do a test run of like, I'm going to smack this drum really hard, boom, and listen to how that sounds. And then I'm going to take it down 90 percent and just go and just go boom and just listen to the sonic quality of it. Um, so now, I mean, and it's like I said, it's, it's taken years for folks like uh, Jeremy, who who's like grew up in rock band. It's like, I mean, playing the drums is is a. Uh, it's fun. And I'm the same way. I, I love drum kits. I loved it. If I see one, I was just, I, it's everything in me to not just go over there and beat on it. <laughs> and uh, it's fun. And so like when you have to, when you have to rein in how hard you're playing, it takes some of the fun out of it. And so that is just, um, but you can get to a place where you start really loving your role, which we have some podcasts around this, and you start looking at at being uh, a part of this of this group of people that are going to do something to make Jesus look really great, and that becomes that becomes more worth it to you than an outlet to play the drums and have a great time. Um, and also, I think uh, I've seen drummers go from I'm playing on a 10 or 11 you know on on the volume scale all the way down to a 3 or 4 because they start thinking like a producer and so they start going I know now how this is translating to folks in their ears whether it's in an auditorium people are sitting out there or whether it's in a studio and if I let that drum speak because the harder you smack, there's all kinds of like compression things that happen when you when you really lay into a drum. Some a lot of the low end goes away. It's like if you kick a kick drum really hard and just listen to it, and then you kick it really soft. What's well, if you kick it soft? There's just all this low end gush. That's like sometimes when we're in the studio, we literally take our finger. I mean, there's a track on the new hymns record where Jeremy's just tapping the the floor tom, and it's just like this 
epic. You would never guess what we're doing. Um, but if, if you were to take a stick and slam that thing, it would have half the low end and a lot more like attack and top end. And so it's deceiving on on that. And so uh, so that and that's just like uh, having like relational uh, equity and trust equity within your band and and doing things like that where you can have these conversations freely. Um, and and so some things that you can do to accomplish like lowering that volume level is things like this. So the questions you would be asking is what kind of drum kit am I playing? Um, a buddy of ours, Joey Parrish, makes these little drum kits called Parrish kits, something that we traveled around for years. And uh, and typically he's using some kind of like brush instead of a stick. They sound amazing on it. Um, and there's different kinds of brushes that you can get. Um, they're huge. It's a little tiny kit. It fits in a case. We fly it on the plane under 50 pounds, yeah. and it's a kick, tom, snare, and uh, and it's it's huge. But the part of the hugeness is is that you're hitting it with brushes soft, and uh, what they're made of isn't as like isn't as loud as like your normal stick on a on a normal head on a tom or whatever. Um, and so just what kind of drum kit is a good question. And that there's probably, you can go into detail probably on what kind of head you have and all those kinds of things. And then the, what kind of sticks are you playing with? So that's a huge, I mean, that's just a massive deal. If you go, what, what are the big sticks you're just saying with the big old Yeah, you just probably shouldn't be using a, a size 2B yeah. drumstick, which is just really big. You just don't need I it. I love big drumsticks. Yeah. I think they're so fun. Um, yeah, and if you if you go from sticks to to brushes, I mean, sometimes we even use like these brooms. I think they're called broom brushes broom sticks or broom and sticks then sticks or uh, cajon brushes that are really great too. Yeah, they kind of mimic a broom. Totally, kind of and it's just like, I mean, yeah. they just have this little this little fluffy thing going along with them, and um and uh and what kind of symbols you're using? You know, some symbols are just obnoxious, and some are darker. Uh, again, uh, uh, on the Parish Drums website, um, Joey started to kind of, he loves dark symbols. And so a lot of his symbols are kind of, I think they're called Republic. Yep. There's, I mean, I don't know symbols, Jeremy, you know symbols better than I do, but th that could be a whole other conversation. But those are some questions you can ask. What kind of kit? What kind of sticks? What kind of symbols? And then isolating that drum kit is a great idea. Uh, I mean, hitting soft is also a great idea, but I know how it is. Sure. It's like, uh, we've had a conversation about hitting soft, but then man, we get to chorus one of song one and that has gone out out the window. And uh, in theory, we all would like that, but it's just not happening and we don't have another drummer. And and and, uh, and so, you know, you're stuck in this position where like, okay, so I mean, I'm, I'm actually a huge fan of drum shields and drum cages and, anything that would help isolate uh, to keep that that snare hit and those cymbals out of the vocal mics and off the first 10 rows. Uh, and so things like that are helpful, like a drum shield's helpful. Um, you know, there's uh, some churches, you see these big round things that yeah. they're putting up that kind of, that block some sim the cymbal symbols, frequencies. Yeah. And those are, those are helpful, but um, I'm a huge fan of isolating I mean, it doesn't look as cool as you want it to look, but uh, for the sake of um, for the sake of serving the body, serving the song, um, getting the main thing out that what you want to, so you have like a clean slate to work with. Um, I think that's a that's a fantastic idea. I think another th just simple question um, is if you are miking uh, or or, or is a, where you're putting your drum kit. Sure. And so some of the things that a lot of people don't think about is like um, you you just you put it where it looks the best. So you're balancing your stage and you put your drums here and your electric here, your bass, your singers. But you may be you may think it may serve you well to think, how can I get this drum kit as far away from vocal mics as possible or a cello mic right? or whatever mic is on the stage that's miking? Because let me just tell you, those mics are room mics for drums so they are a vocal mic but it's also gonna be 
your room mic for your drums and you will not be able to get a pounding drum kit out of vocal mics and so and that's a, a lot of the issues we're facing um, and that uh, that uh, begs the question of what vocal mics are you using so like a, a beta 58 or sm58 um, you know is is going to work a lot better than you know your some of your kind of higher end uh, microphones that kind of pick up, they have a lot of top end and a lot of sizzle and they're going to just pick up cymbal sizzle. And so something that's a little bit more contained and a little bit more dull on the top, you can add top into it on the board. Um, and so also another thought that came to mind is, uh, you know, often if you're using wedges, which we're a huge fan of in-ears, um, and have some things to say even about volume as it that in-ears can help with that as well. But if you're not on in-ears and you're using wedges, lots of times drums and whatever sounds through those wedges are causing all kinds of like uh, sonic chaos. Um, if, we're, if we're at a place and we have wedges or even if we have like a, some people, just the other day where there was a sub on stage mm -hmm. for, the, for the drummer and like a big bass cab, and if you're struggling out there in front of house, I mean, a lot of times the first thing we'll do is like turn off the sub on stage, turn off the wedges on stage and just go and, and just see what happens. And, and often it's like, oh, there's just like this low, this low mid honk that I can't get rid of because speakers are pointed the other direction toward the stage and there's all kinds of bass traps in there and it's all bouncing everywhere. And, uh, and so that may be a whole nother, I mean, you could have... 85 decibels coming out of wedges and it sounds horrible of course it hurts your ears um and so that's a whole other uh, a, a conversation of like man maybe going just to in-ears which doesn't have to be way outrageous expensive where you get the the best roland or avium unit or whatever um that can be a possible thing um for you to just move to in-ears and what that can do for you as a player. Um, Jeremy talks really well about this. Why don't you just talk about that of just what in-ears can do to help you contain. Sure. <laughs> your yeah. urges. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a music podcast. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, moral of the story here with answering this question is that it's nuanced. There's a lot of things that play into managing volume, especially drum volume and turning up your, uh, you know, just cranking your vocal mics up to match the drummer doesn't necessarily solve your problem because like he was just talking about that vocal mics room mic for your drums, especially if you don't have shield. So you're just fighting a losing battle a little bit, but there's so many different layers to this, but I will say specifically about in-ears. Um, one of the things, if, if, if you are having volume issues as a drummer, you're being told a lot, you want to, you need to play quieter. Um, and you do use in-ears, you need to be really thoughtful about what you're putting in your mix. Um, we did a, a whole episode on how to build a great in-ear mix and what to think about and how to think really strategically about that. And both of us kind of fall in the camp of wanting to be inspired with what we're listening to while we're leading. However, you have to prioritize what allows you to play your role really well and be faithful with what's in front of you. And so uh, being inspired kind of has to take a back seat if that comes at the cost of well, that means I'm going to play really loud and distract everybody and make a lot of people think about how they need to go talk to the sound guy about how loud it is after instead of singing the song to the God of the universe. And so um, one really helpful thing is if you have overhead mics, make sure they're in your in your mix. Just make sure they're in there and pretty loud. Um, and if there's compression, if you've got your own dedicated monitor console um, and there's a bunch of compression on your overheads, I mean, I'll tell sound guys that all the time of like, hey, the first thing I need you to do is take off any compression or gates or anything off all the drums because I just want to hear what I'm actually doing. Because if it's smashing my overheads, when I'm laying into a ride cymbal in my ears, it feels fantastic. Or even the louder you're playing the software. Gets. That's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Like as I get even bigger and bigger, it it's staying at the exact same volume in my ears. And and I'll realize it because I'll sit there and I'm like, I'm like, my arm is sore, mm -hmm. but I'm like, so this shouldn't be happening. And I'm, I know this symbol is like louder than what I'm hearing. And so making sure you've got an accurate picture of what is actually happening 
on your drum set in your in-ears is going to help you a ton. And a lot of times, especially in situations where I know we're in a really small room or whatever, I know I need to play a lot quieter, I'll crank the overheads where it's like, I mean, to tap on it, just like a small, I mean, 50% stroke on the ride cymbal is like, borderline too much for, for me to, to listen to so that it makes me just play really quiet or it's going to hurt me. And so, I mean, I'll do that just to make sure I'm putting a bridle on myself to, you know, make sure I don't just ruin the whole thing. And so you can be really strategic about how you build your mix, um, to, uh, set yourself up for success there. And I think communication is such a huge piece here. Like if worship leaders are struggling with how to talk to your drummer about, man, I need him to play quieter. But every time I kind of talk to him about his playing, he gets defensive. Like there's so many philosophical things here that can be helpful. One, I mean, just like what you talked about earlier of you got to be way more excited about the role you're playing as a worship drummer. Um, and, and, with that group of people in that moment, what you are doing is such a, an incredible gift to be a part of. And it is so much better than just having an outlet to play and just to go have fun shredding on a drum set. Um, and it shouldn't be your outlet for that. It's, it's a bigger deal than that. And so the more, the sooner at, drummers out there can really wrap your heart around that vision, the more excited you're going to be to do the things that as a man, purely for, you know, what I want to do as a drummer, I might be sacrificing enjoyment or whatever. But when I understand how big of a deal it is that we're doing, it makes me excited to do whatever I need to do. So for worship leaders communicating to a drummer about that, cast that vision often outside of the context of telling him to play quieter. If you're casting that vision all the time of what the, the role is of a musician, of any musician on stage, whether that's a guitar player who just loves to riff a solo all the time that doesn't need to be there or a bass player who just, he just wants to drive with a pick and just play nothing but 16 notes or whatever, whatever it might be, um, cast that vision to where you now have that context, that relational collateral that you talked about, where when it's time to ha talk to that drummer about you, it, it's got to be quieter. It's coming from a place of not because I don't like your playing, not because you're not good, but because this has the potential to, to distract even one person from connecting with the Lord while we're leading them in worship. And what can we do practically to help you play that role better? Because right now we keep running into the same role block of volume. And so, um, and should get drummers excited to work on that. That's something you got to practice. It's just oh. like really, really hard to do. Like, I mean, like you said, I grew up playing in rock bands, playing in clubs, playing really loud, heavy cymbals with loud bands and, Two B sticks, just big sticks, and just you know, and so it's it's it's. I have to work really, and I still don't do it really well. I mean, like, there's times where I, I get to have the luxury of you know what a Travis Brockway is mixing, and it's he's running at a hundred, and it feels really great, even though I'm just going bananas on the drums. And but there are plenty of times where I've had to work really diligently to make sure I've developed that tool to use it when it's appropriate. Yeah. So and I think you can fall in love with that. You can fall in love with that musically if you just recorded recorded a a a bead. Let's just rock out, hit hard, and let's just pull back and barely hit. And that goes with just every how instrument. How good it sounds! Yeah, you know, I'm singing too hard, or I'm just just sure. you know, whatever. Or I'm playing too hard. And uh, I you know I remember this one church. Um, we had the drummer who got it. It was like he saw he saw he saw that they're because of what they're doing the team on the stage someone might go out of one kingdom be transferred out of the domain of darkness into the kingdom of the beloved son and they might see jesus in a way that their life is forever their eternity is different and they're saved and he got it and he he played a snare drum just a snare drum he's holding it he just played it <laughs> and um one of the greatest worship experiences i've ever had was uh you know, it was at a pre-conference and Matt Redman was playing and his drummer was playing an Irish drum and he was literally only played backbeats. And, uh, and there's something really powerful about that. And he didn't, he had a, you just play it with your, I think he switched with your hand or something. And, um, and so, uh, just, uh, getting around, uh, the thought of the word of Christ dwelling richly among us as we're teaching and admonishing one another versus 
This is our musical outlet. These speakers right. are bigger than anything we've ever played through before. Right. This room is bigger. There's more people here. But man, you have such an opportunity. Um, and there's a lot of practical things you can do from the way uh, you set up your stage to what you're playing to what kind of PA you have and how it's EQ'd and how it's all the things. And we're going to, I mean, that's that's kind of the stuff that we love to talk about. And yep. and we'll be getting into that. But I think Jeremy's right of just sharing a common heart, bringing the mission in front of your team to where any of this stuff isn't going to make somebody's day really sour, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, we're just doing it in order that we might serve the body well. And so, man, we're praying for you. And uh, thank you so much for sending in your question. And all of you out there who are struggling with this, man, we are, uh, we, we get it, we know it. Um, and uh, we're praying that God would give you a deep heart to serve your body well. Amen. Amen. We obviously, just kind of scratched the surface of a topic like this, uh, but always getting into more and more questions that hopefully dig deeper uh, into the ways that we can grow as worship leaders and musicians. And so keep, like Shane said, keep sending us your questions to ask Shane B at worshipinitiative.com. We love you. We're praying for you. We'll see you next time. See y'all.